Hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. This is our local history slash indigenous stories program in Unbroken Circle, Indigenous Communities on the Seacoast. My name is Katie Chukowski. I'm the Special Collections Librarian here at the Portsmouth Public Library in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And I'm joined tonight by my colleagues, Helena Vasilia, Nicole Longo Cloutier, who is on Zoom, and Chrissy Bryant, our programming librarian. And I'd like to begin tonight with our land acknowledgement. The city of Portsmouth is on the homelands of the Abenaki people who have ongoing cultural and spiritual connections to this area. According to tribal oral tradition, Abenaki people have lived in the place now called New Hampshire for more than 12,000 years, since before tribal memory. The Abenaki are part of a larger group of, in, of indigenous people who call themselves Wabanaki, or people of the dawn, and form one of many communities connected by a common language family. Here at the Portsmouth Public Library, we are committed to acknowledging and honoring the human history tied to this land. Tonight's event is going to last until 8.30, and we plan to be respectful of your time. For those attending on Zoom, uh, we do have you muted and ask you to stay that way during the presentation. Please type any questions into the chat, and we'll share as many of them as we can with our panelists at the end. This event is being recorded, and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And our program tonight is quite special as it kicks off two of our uh, programming series for the year, Indigenous Stories and Local History. As Portsmouth is honoring the anniversary of 400 years since the settlement by English colonists, we hope that both of these series help to provide unique views on the history of this area. Our local history programming for the year is going to be quarterly rather than monthly, uh, so we can bring you special events like tonight's discussion. We're also planning a panel for April with local sustainability and planning leaders to discuss their visions of Portsmouth in 400 years. How will the climate crisis and sea level change affect this area, and what can we do to ensure our town's legacy isn't lost? Our next Indigenous Stories event will be on Tuesday, March 28th. And we're going to be hosting Laura Judge and Jedediah Crook, and their work focuses on Indigenous representation in library collections and how it translates to our understanding of this land called New Hampshire. Both of those events are being finalized and will be in our library calendar soon, so definitely keep an eye out for those. And as always, we love to hear about what you'd like to see at the library, so we have an event feedback form that we ask you to fill out if you're so inclined. Uh, for those of you who are here tonight, we have a stack out in the hallway, just out there on the windowsill. And for those of you online, we'll share a link uh, to our online feedback form and we'll put that in the chat. And if you fill it out, you'll help us out and you'll be entered to win a library book bag. The bag does have to be picked up at the library if you were a winner, um, but the extra trip is worth it if you're one of the good trips. <laughs> and I really want to thank our panelists and our moderator, and all of you for being here tonight. Uh, we at the library, like the rest of the town, have been deciding how we would honor Portsmouth during this anniversary year. Uh, the town recently put up new lamppost signs for the 400, and the slogan on those is history lights the way. And we in the local history special collection definitely agree with the sentiment, um, but we also believe that it's our job to shine a little light on history sometimes to ensure that the stories that have been kept in the dark find their way out, and those who have been pushed to the margins can be centered. So we hope you'll find time this year to visit us in the special collections room. It's on the second floor of the library, and we hope you'll continue to learn about Portsmouth, its history, and its people. And with that, I will now turn it over to our moderator for tonight's event, Catherine Stewart. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us here virtually and in the room. It's lovely to be in a faith here with you all. My name is Catherine Stewart. I use the pronoun she, her. And I am a resident here in Portsmouth and a writer and a director. I make film and theatre work. 
Um, and I'm going to somewhat guide us through the conversation tonight, but uh, this is a really open uh, kind of conversation with a really wonderful panel, and we'll be coming to questions uh, with all of you later on in the evening. So if uh, something comes to mind, try and keep a hold of it, and there'll be an opportunity for conversation and discussion a little bit later on. What I'd love to do first before handing it over to our panelists in the room here in the library is just introduce you to our uh, two virtual panelists who are out there. Um, and so first I'm going to just hand it over to Anne Jennison to introduce herself. Hi Anne. Hi, Catherine. Thank you. My name is Anne Jennison. I am a traditional storyteller and an historian, amongst other things, grandmother. Um, I have European and Abenaki heritage, and I'm joining you from my home in Lee, New Hampshire, on the other side of Great Bay. Thank you, Anne. And I'm also very happy to introduce you all to Kathleen Blake. Hello, everyone. I'm Kathleen Blake. And um, I also have mixed heritage, my indigenous heritage being with the Wendat, the Anishinaabe Ojibwa, the Algonquin, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, and I am a, a scientist and a retired educator, also a grandmother. And uh, the, the four of us are, are all members of INHCC, which I'm sure somebody will mention later on. It's nice to see you. Yeah. As Kathleen just mentioned there, we are all members, including myself, of a group called Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective. There'll be more information about that group. We also have a few other co-conspirators in the room with us here tonight. Um, so we can tell you more about that too, but it's a delight to be able to bring non-Indigenous and Indigenous individuals together uh, to work on bringing Indigenous culture knowledge more to the forefront. And without further ado, I'd love to have pass over to Paul and Denise. Hello friends, my name is Denise Pulio. I'm the head female speaker and this is Paul Pulio, the head male speaker and chief of the Kawasak Band of the Penacook Abnaki people. We come to you today um, from our ancient Penacook village of Odenaku Nippi, which translates to the village of the narrowing waters now known as Alton, New Hampshire. So um, as we begin tonight's presentation, um, oh, interesting. Yes. Huh. Um, so it's interesting because one computer is actually showing the slides forwarding and the other one's still stuck on the introductory slide. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as we start tonight's um, presentation, um, we always give a land acknowledgement at the beginning of every segment, but as you heard tonight, um, the library has already given the land acknowledgement that they adopted quite a few years ago. Um, so this is one that we gener generally share um, with audiences. And um, I'll read it just so you can hear the Abenaki words that are um, contained within it pronounced. This presentation takes place within Piscataqua, 
which has been translated to Piscataqua, <laughs> um, which roughly translates to a branched river watershed, which is located within Indakina, our homelands, and is the unceded traditional ancestral lands and waterways of the Penacook, Abenaki, and Wabanaki peoples past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the Aki, land, Nebi, water, Awan, air, Olakwikak, flora, and Awaasak, fauna, and, and for our ancestors, the Alnumbak, humans, who have stewarded in Dakina throughout the generations for over 13,000 years. What we're looking at here is a, uh, uh, the traditional territory of the uh, Abnaki people in general. It's, uh, we've developed this by using meets and bounds, kind of like an old English uh, way of uh, determining a territory by using geographical locations and markers that were identified as boundaries between different tribal groups. When you look at this map, you'll see that it covers uh, a section of uh, Cape Ann and out through to the Connecticut River, uh, encompassing a small part of Massachusetts, going almost uh, three quarters of New, uh, Vermont, up and into the uh, St. Lawrence, back down through the Kennebec and um, we said Lake uh, Watershed and back down through the coast of New Hampshire and be, you know, beyond the Isle of Shoals. So you, you look at this territory, it's rather large. Uh, it was a one particular uh, tribal uh, identification there. Everybody spoke the same language or nearly the same language. And uh, you can see that's quite a big territory. Mm. So traditionally, when we begin our educational lessons um, back before colonialization, we always taught within a, within a storytelling frame. And so tonight, I would like to start in that same genre that we did for thousands upon thousands of years. So at this juncture, I'd like to turn it over to Ann Jennison, who will share a story with us. Long, long ago, in a village here in Indakina, our homeland, there lived a young boy who went hunting for birds every day to help feed his family. But one day the boy wasn't having too much luck hunting for birds at the edge of the woods. That's where he usually hunted. So he went further into the woods and he found many birds. Now at midday, he found a clearing and a huge stone, a boulder in the center of it. So he climbed up on the boulder and he began to eat his lunch, of parched corn. And as he was eating, he heard a deep voice sing, shall I tell you stories? Well, he looked all around, he was startled. He looked all around the clearing. There's no one there. He, he couldn't tell where the voice was coming from. Well, he went back eating his meal again and the voice said again, shall I tell you stories? The boy suddenly realized that there was no person in the clearing. It was the huge stone that was speaking. He never had heard of a talking stone, but he answered anyway. What does this mean to tell stories? Well, there was a time when there were no stories. The huge stone answered him and said, it is to tell of things that happened a long time ago. Well, the boy thought and he decided quickly, I think I'd like that. I think I would like to hear stories. And so the stone began to tell the boy stories. It told him stories from the time when the people lived up in the sky. It told stories of the earth's creation. It told stories of long, long ago when the animal people could talk to each other. And the boy was enchanted. He couldn't get enough. But when the sun went down, he knew it was time to go back to his village. So he asked the stone if he could come back again. And the stone said, only if you promise not to tell anyone what you have heard. So the boy agreed. And he went home. And he had fewer birds, much less birds than he usually did. His mother was confused. But she decided you can't be lucky hunting every day, not to worry. So the following day, she watched as her son ran out to the forest at fast speed. And she hoped that he meant he'd be returning with many birds to help feed the family. Well, instead of hunting, the boy immediately returned to that clearing, climbed up on that huge boulder, closed his eyes, and listened. Ah, oh, he listened all day long. He didn't go home until sunset. 
And then he used his slingshot and he, he caught a few birds that were lingering and he went home. His mother was kind of upset. She thought maybe something bad was happening to her son. She didn't understand why he was having such bad luck hunting. And his family, you know, they decided they needed to find out. So the next day when they sent their son out, as he went to go hunting, they sent another boy, a second boy from their village to follow him all the way into the forest. But when that second boy reached the clearing, he saw the first boy sitting up on this huge stone on the boulder. And he said, what are you doing? Why aren't you hunting? Why aren't you hunting for your family? I am listening to the stone tell stories. Stories. Would you like to listen? What, what does this mean to tell stories? The second boy asked. It's to tell of things that happened a long time ago. So the second boy jumped up onto the boulder and they both sat there with their eyes closed and their ears open and their minds open. And they spent the day and they caught every word. They were caught up in the stories. Well, they returned every day, day after day to hear those stone stories. And still their families didn't have any idea what they were doing and why now two of them weren't bringing home very many birds. So finally their family sent two men to, to follow them into the woods to find out what the boys were up to. Well, when the men saw the two boys, they came to the clearing, they saw them sitting up in this boulder listening to a voice that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere. They asked them, what are you doing? Why aren't you hunting for your families? We're listening to the stone tell stories. Would you like to listen to stories? What does this mean to tell stories, the men asked. It is to tell of things that happened a long time ago. Well, the men cautiously agreed, but when they got up and sat on the huge stone boulder, they too were whisked away to magical lands in the sky and the times when the animal people could talk to one another and they couldn't get enough. Well, when the last story was told and the sun was setting, the stone spoke to all four of them. Now you must bring all of your people to hear my stories tomorrow. Everyone, everyone must come. Everyone must listen. So when the entire village arrived the next day, the storytelling stone told all of its stories. It told stories from the time when the people lived in the sky. It told stories of the earth's creation. It told those stories of long, long ago when the animal people could speak with one another. And the people were overwhelmed. They were undone. They had never heard anything so wonderful, so beautiful. They had never been so transported. And when the sun began to set, the stone spoke its final words. You must keep these stories until the end of time. Tell them to your children and your children's children. For now, I'm done. And the stone fell silent. The people returned home, recounting the stories, telling them to each other and sharing them again and again and again. And ever since the time that stone brought all of the stories into the world, the people here in our homeland and in Dakana have been less lonely, less cold in the winter storytelling season. They've had more knowledge and they've been happier. And that's how that story goes. That's the end of that story. Oh, hey. Thank you for listening. Seal and Ian, thank you so much for sharing that story and bringing us um, to, to bringing us uh, forward with it, a traditional viewpoint on how um, stories transform lives and shape futures. And so, as we begin tonight, we're sharing small bit tidbits of history and stories that uh, have been passed down through the generations. Um, this is just a superficial highlight of some of the history that has gone on here in this place. Um, but we want to get through a little bit of history so we can really dwell, dwell on the present and what we're doing today. So they're um, setting the presentation back up. <laughs> you know, when I was thinking about that story this afternoon, 
it, it struck me as every time I hear a story, every time I tell a story, I hear something new in it. And I was reminded of the, the teaching that, I, that I've, I've always heard, you know, we are made of the earth. We are made of the earth and water. That's what nourishes us when we're in our mother. That's what's nourishing us our whole lives long. And so it's not unusual to think that our very stories come from the stones, you know, come from our ancestors, come from the earth. It's just an interesting thought because I think it sets a good, um, gives a good setting for the, for the thousands of years of history right up to the present that we're going to be talking about this evening. Mm. Thank you. This is a time of year uh, after the winter solstice. This is a time we would tell our stories to our children. It became tradition that uh, when we would retreat uh, more or less into the warmth of our wigwams and longhouses, we would start telling these stories. And that's how the tradition was continued for, for multiple generations. It was a time that we didn't do as much hunting and fishing, and it was a time to tell these stories to reinforce the uh, oral traditions of our community. And it would happen from the first uh, snowfalls until the uh, time of maple syruping. Um, I'm going to talk- Speaking of stories. <laughs> stories. Um, one of the things we started with today was uh, a lot of our musicology is based on uh, telling a story or a prayer. The, the song we sang in the beginning was an honoring of uh, the land our ancestors and the creator that put us here. And all of these fit into the paradigm of how we would do storytelling. So even with musicology, music in any form, chants, they were always meant to uplift and retell our oral traditions through song. The important thing for you to understand is the Ab Abnaki in particular are unique. It's originally the root word came from Alnumbach, meaning human beings. And then it became the human beings from the Donlin, and that's how you get that Wabanaki. What's really interesting is the coastal areas of New England, from the Kennebec down to, say, uh, Plum Island and the, uh, the Merrimack, this was strictly one particular smaller group of people in the Wabanaki Confederation, and they were the true Abnaki right here. What was interesting is, as, as I've done a lot of research, the Lenape, who call, call themselves the grandparents of the Algonquin speaking people, they claim they came from Siberia along the land bridge. And when they came across from multiple generations and finally ended up on the East Coast, they said surprisingly they met up with their paleo older ancestors, which they called the ancient ones that were here in the Donlin before they arrived which is an interesting construct that I've been trying to analyze because the oral traditions of some of the other Lenape spinoff tribes are different than those that here in this era, which uses Gluskabe, that mythical being that worked with the creator. And when we look at these stories, we find out that the Lenape said the wolf clans broke off from the main body of people and formed the tribes of the Connecticut mainly the Pequots, uh, Mohegans, and the Narragansetts. And that still fits in with the tradition. We always told our stories from Gluskop. They told all their oral traditions through a mythical wolf called Molson. So when we look at this, there's a lot of truth in all stories. Even though it's multi-thousands of years of age, we look at this as some of the proof that these oral traditions still linger today. So um, we'll talk uh, real briefly about uh, vi village life or Odina, which is translates to village. Uh, so the main um, focus in the village was protection and it was um, supplying uh, heat and other required necessities to maintain life. We had a very strong matriarchal society, still do today. And, um, and we encourage that. <laughs> uh, but, and, but seriously, um, our female roles um, were called, our female leaders were called Sagamo Squaws, which you heard me use that term earlier in this presentation. Uh, the reason why I'm bringing slight focus to that at this moment is um, you'll hear nationally um, that there are place change names being conducted where they're removing the term squaw from place names. Squaw is actually not a word. It never was a word. It's a, suff it's a suffix. So as you hear in uh, Sagamo Squaw, Sagamo means head speaker and the squaw 
translates it into a female um, form of that word. Um, so it cannot stand alone. It's a suffix. So we support the removal of that term across the nation. However, we still reserve the right to use it within its traditional sense within our language. Um, females own the property within our village. Um, we controlled literally everything. Um, we controlled when the went, men went to war, we, we controlled everything. Um, we had fluid gender roles. Um, so there, we didn't have um, issues with sexuality or the way a person dressed. Um, what we cared about truly was the way a person interacted with society and how, um, how they took care of the environment and each other. Um, our, a lot of times you'll hear that uh, tribes are divided based on gender roles for jobs. Um, we did not have that. Um, we find that uh, within our, well, we look back and do our research um, through our culture that we highlighted the natural abilities of that person. It doesn't make any sense to put a really great basket maker out in a boat fishing, you know, um, so we allow the person to do what was necessary um, to uplift them and make them the most beneficial person to society. Um, it really took a village to raise a, you know, to raise and maintain a community. Um, here is pictured um, one of the earliest uh, uh, drawings of the Abnaki, and you can see we were fully dressed um, from head to toe. And uh, so we weren't running around naked like a lot of times people think. Um, so it would have hurt with the trees. Um, so yeah, um, but hey. <laughs> Um, next. Well, so go ahead, Paul, we'll talk about Jesuit commentary. <laughs> you know, I've, I've done a lot of deep research. Uh, a lot of the colonial English Puritan-based history uh, portrayed us as uh, savages, especially people like Cotton Mather and others. Uh, the Jesuits, on the other hand, were more into the documentation, uh, mainly to determine uh, what the, the Pope would uh, do with us, essentially. And what they reported back was we were uh, monotheistic, we were, we didn't have multiple spirits, which they, they started to find in other tribal communities. We're fully uh, uh, clothed and deeply spiritual. So what was really different was they, they actually said we were not like other savages because, and we, we take that term in the, in the time when it was uh, mentioned, because other tribes like the Mohawks were, were basically, uh, you know, undressed all the time. And they said we're completely different. They also said the biggest problem they had was the matriarchy, because under Catholicism, it's a patriarchy, and constantly our women would be arguing with the priests or the Jesuit um, missionaries, because they felt that uh, the place was, you know, centered on the women, and the women would debate whether or not the Bible was meant anything to us. So it was really a completely different situation. From the earliest writings I found, um, including up on the Kennebec with Real, he was very diligent in teaching French and English to the point that uh, the whole village of uh, Norwich was capable to be able to read and write in English in that time period, which is shocking compared to Puritans, which unless they had a good education, they, they didn't have those same skill sets that the Abnaki actually had. And, and because of that, we were able to read and interpret the Bible, we understood Christianity, in a lot of the parallels in our culture with being a monotheistic group that smudged and, and did sweat lodges and bathed, uh, the, the Jesuits quickly saw the similarities of uh, uh, immersion, you know, like baptism, smudging, uh, like incense and myrrh. Uh, so there was, a, there was a really strong sense of uh, spirituality that was embodied in our whole community. And more importantly, we had this principle of justice and democracy of consensus. It means that everything we debated was done in a peaceful fashion without any negativity. We are righteous, so we never did anything deceptive in our conversations. And we also believed in what we call power, empowerment. Every decision made in the village, like we said, it takes a village to survive. Every decision had to have empowerment so that we knew that uh, subsequent generations would be able to live with whatever decision we made. This was very strong in our culture up until colonial conflict and in those time periods. So it was very important. 
Mm. I, I see we jumped the slide. Yep. So um, here's a photo, uh, or not a photo, because we didn't have photos <laughs> back then. But here's a picture of um, uh, from a draftsman, um, Antonio Rodriguez. He was um, he was Spanish. Um, done in 1799 of Abnaki, um, showing what we look, look like in that time period. Those are in our tribal archives right now, the originals. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things is I've done, I do a lot of scholarly reading, and one guy named Kenneth Morrison uh, wrote about uh, the paradigms that uh, impacted right here, right here, here in the Portsmouth area. And he identified seven critical things that changed the way we, we behaved and how we became assimilated and acculturated. And primarily technology was right there in the forefront because we were a stone age people working with stone tools, introductions of metals like copper and, and cast iron and, and steel became uh, one of the major changes in our culture. We also, uh, religion and ethics, we were very quick to accept Christianity, especially the, uh, Roman Catholic uh, uh, doctrine. Um, warfare, though, was also something that was constantly at our, at our heels, driving us out of our homelands. And uh, there was a, a lot of plagues and diseases that were uh, migrating from the St. Lawrence all the way down to Cape Cod. That's why when everybody hears about Cape Cod in the 1690s, everybody was dead before the pilgrims landed. That was probably one of the terminus time periods when the plagues, which started uh, roughly in the middle 1500s around Quebec or Montreal, traveled all the way down the coast from Maine, probably came through this area in the 1618 time period or so, and it devastated our populations or reduced uh, our people uh, significantly. Um, colonial land use and settlement, though, was the biggest uh, impact because Colonial, uh, because we were uh, river people and we relied on fish and the estuaries here, the building of dams and closing off our fishways uh, put a major pinch on us in our food and sustainability. And, and then not to mention the trade and commerce that came here when the Puritans were really highly motivated to, to sell rum to us to poison our minds and to make us weak in our decision-making. So when you combine all those things, it was a formula for disaster for people that didn't understand alcohol, didn't understand steel and tools and gunpowder and all those things. Mm -hmm. our, our landscape was uh, a pure Eden here. Uh, it had everything we needed, especially the waterways, estuary, this area in particular, this was like Eden. We had large forests that were right up to the ocean. And these ecosystems that were here provided all the food resources you could ever imagine. And, you know, the lakes and streams and everything that were here provided us uh, transportation, it provided us the food, uh, medicines. And every time we had an ice out, there was always new materials being washed down from the high country, always replenishing our fields. So we always had a good agricultural base. Mm -hmm. and. And we did modify quite a bit with uh, uh, culture by uh, modifying the foods here and trading seeds from other areas, try to acculturate in this area, like oaks that we brought up from the south. And um, yeah, here, take this opportunity to uh, invite Kathleen into the conversation here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's important uh, to mention that despite living here for well over 12,000 years, or about 13,000 years, or 99.97% of the time that this land was occupied was only the indigenous people, we lived in harmony with our environment. We did farm, uh, we did work with the forest doing, um, burns to, to maintain the forest in a way that we wanted to. But what we never did was decimate the land. We never continued to plant in the same place over and over and over again and destroy the soil and the nutrients in it. Um, and that's, that's a significant difference from the way we live today. There were no pesticides, no herbicides, no fungicides, yet we still maintained our villages and our people's um, so that's just an, an interesting uh, thing to think about. When the Europeans arrived, the land was cleared for several miles from the coast inland, and uh, it, it was our home. 
and um, it's important to to keep that in mind when you when you're thinking about the way that things were because everything changed with the advent of colonization. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Kathleen. Kathleen. We'll just then take just a second to, to bring the slides back up. Yeah. It's very interesting because in the colonial records, um, um, it's very it's not mentioned very often, but in the colonial records, they would talk about how they were able to run outside at the in the night and not worry about poking an eye out with the trees because there were no branches to poke their eyes out. Um, and they talked about how the ground was a carpet of pine needles and how it was soft to walk on. So um, you know, what, when you go to uh, conservation societies and other places where you see, you know, all the debris and everything that's all over the ground, that's not what it looked like. That's not proper land stewardship in our view. Um, and so we're trying to work with these groups to actually encourage proper land stewardship, but um, the lands and how we maintained it were vastly different. Um, so <laughs> one, one of the things that uh, we were just mentioning is we, we'd read these narratives from the Puritans that arrived here. They'd say, by the grace of God, I found these beautiful intervales and all planted with corn, beans, and squash given to us by God in, the, in these places where it's like parklands and open spaces where we could take our oxen and carts into the woods. Uh, we're pretty sure that this whole area was cleared like... Uh, Kathleen said, for several miles inland. We don't think we did this all the way up into the White Mountains uh, because most of the food resources kept us close to the, to the shorelines of the lakes, uh, rivers, and the ocean. Uh, we were the caretakers of this place, though, and that was really important. Um, so one of the tools that we've been um, researching and utilizing is the Chester Price map. And um, this gives land trails. Um, that were indigenously um, created. And so um, there's a lot of controversy that surrounds this map. There are some people that says it's total butkus. And then there are others that um, say it's an amazing map. Um, we have been researching the map and um, have actually been hiking the trails that have been listed here on the map. And I, we, so we can tell you that the trails that we have walked so far are absolutely legitimate. And so um, we cannot throw this map under the bus <laughs> um, because, um, you know, there are things on the map that have been um, found to be true. Um, the map is also based on um, archaeological finds um, that were done within the state. Uh, this map was created in 1950. Um, so they, you know, this was based on archaeological finds that they that were found up until that point. Uh, and this is a map of um, the waterways, which were our highways. Um, and so it's a lot faster to jump in a canoe and go with the water flow than it is to try to walk anywhere. Uh, so this is a map of, that we have been slowly working on um, that depicts the waterways without dams, um, because the waterways you see now are not the waterways that used to be here. Um, so we're living with a manipulated environment. And so we're trying to um, turn the clock back um, figuratively, um, so we can look at this space um, as it was once intended. You have to imagine, though, uh, we could travel the whole length of Winnipesaukee from Alton all the way up to uh, Santa Harbor on snowshoes on that ice faster than you could imagine. So even in the winter, these waterways were major routes for us to travel. That's why we could take captives and go from, from the Boston area to Quebec in, in such a short time period. We were very, we very effectively used all of our landscape for travel. Mm. So these spaces, because um, they were so um, highly uh, maintained, um, they were became the most um, wanted lands, bluntly. Uh, the second the colonials landed here, those are the spaces that they occupied immediately uh, because, quote, the work was already done. The village was already built. The gardens were already established. Um, anyone who owns a piece of property in New Hampshire can tell you or has the experience of how long it takes to establish anything here in the state. You know, you think you got it, went out and put a garden in this year. Well, guess what? <laughs> Next year, you're going to have to do it all over again. And it's going to take you a few years before it's actually settled in and stabilized. And so um, when you have these types of lands that have been well stabilized, obviously new tenants want to gravitate to those spaces the first. Um, so the, along with that, they took over our gardens. 
um, and they um, took over our village locations, which in turn obviously started a lot of hostilities. Um, because when you plant gardens and you plan on food, having a certain amount of food um, to survive for that winter, and next thing you know, someone moved in and kicked you out and took your entire food supply, that's going to cause a riff. Next one. One of the things we've been studying, though, is also the uh, colonial trade and trickery. I already mentioned that uh, even here, Richard Waldron was uh, in actually encouraged by the governor to sell larger quantities of rum to the indigenous people. In fact, they they price set the rum cheaper than what they would sell it to the colonial uh, white people uh, just to induce this uh, the poison in us. And this kind of thing and the treachery uh, of uh, inappropriate trade, you know, not paying us uh, dues, you know, paying trinkets for, for very valuable things created a lot of tensions. And the epicenter of a lot of this occurred right here between Portsmouth and uh, Dover. And it was what created a lot of the rifts uh, that uh, happened. There were a lot of indiscriminate murders and uh, slavery was actually first started when Richard Waldron's uh, relatives uh, under his orders took a, a boat up the coast of Maine and captured quite a few important people, not necessarily all Abnaki, but Penobscot and Passamaquoddy as well and sold them into slavery. Unfortunately, some of these people were the, the leaders of the communities where they were taken. And this only spurred on more uh, uh, warfare and violence against colonials because Waldron actually started slavery right here in New England using indigenous people. The trade was to take Africans um, to the Virginias and uh, into New England. And uh, in exchange, they would try to pick up indigenous people to bring to the Azores, Barbados, and, and points uh, into the uh, other side of the Caribbean. So that's what happened, and that's what stirred a lot of treachery and, and deceit and warfare. So what did we do? Um, we tried to find ways to settle disputes and thefts. We'd complain to the courts, and then they passed laws where if we showed up in the courts, they would kill us. Um, so what do you do? Um, we started to attack the things that bothered us. Um, the, we attacked all the dams. The very first thing that the colonials did when they moved here was they established dams, um, which cut off all our fish supplies. Fish was the major food source here in this region. So when all of a sudden your food supplies stopped, you've now lost all your garden spaces, so you can't grow any food. Um, you know, you can see how the tensions were going to rise. Um, so... Well, as we talk about dams real quickly, um, for 200 years prior to colonization here in New England, um, it was already banned in England and, and, and in um, Europe, the, the construction of dams. They already knew the environmental destruction that the dams caused. And so England and Europe had already removed any dams that were built there. And so for them to come here into the, quote, new world and establish dams, they knew darn right what they were doing. They knew that, you know, by doing this, that it was going to hurt and starve the people. Um, and so, but they did it anyways. Not to mention trade, you know, they almost decimated uh, food supply with beaver, you know, for trading for for making top hats in Europe, which was a crazy trade. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and I should also say we did establish the Postal Service. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so as people were being kidnapped down here and being brought um, to uh, New France or Canada or whatever um, contemporary term you want to call it, um, uh, they they it was took too long for a boat to go up around the coast. And so we actually would deliver letters back and forth, um, uh, bringing ransoms. And uh, we, but that, inc that incurred new problems um, between the uh, colonials and the indigenous people because we were multilingual and we could read in those languages, which far exceeded the colonial um, intelligence at that time period. Um, it became a problem because all those letters, we could read them. The English couldn't, but we could. Um, and so they started to create um, uh, forms, you know, with cutouts and um, codes. codes, you know, codexes. Um, so that way they could send letters 
um, back and forth and they would put this piece of paper over and only the highlighted words to create the new message would show. Um, and so they, they established new ways of passing messages back and forth. Um, but in the meantime, these are all the wars that were started um, because of all the, you know, misdealings between the indigenous and the colonial people. But there's an intersection here. Most of these were European wars between the Spanish, French, and English. And uh, if you look at the history of world wars in Europe, a lot of these uh, fell into this area because they're always fighting for these territories. So when you really look at, it wasn't we were starting these wars, you have to look at the construct of all the wars that started in Europe kind of overflowed into this area. And if you really look at the smaller print on this slide, you'll see that each one of them had to do with another greater conflict in the uh, European uh, environment. So, the, you know, we weren't the savages, the Europeans were. So we're going to um, slingshot up to the present. Go ahead. So our current band status. Yeah, our current status is our particular band filed for federal acknowledgement in the 1990s. And there's a whole process to that. And we uh, it was recorded in the federal register. We are still uh, a petitioning group. Uh, unfortunately, we took a stance uh, in the 1990s not to be a casino troop, a group, and because of that, nobody will fund us or lobby for us because all the tribes that are out there seeking federal acknowledgement have had to make a commitment with some gaming organization that would fund all of the multitude of research, genealogy, historical documents, not to mention all the lobbying expenses that you have to use to get your voice heard in Washington. So we're, we're, we sit here protected under US federal law and- uh, We're doing it the hard way. We're doing it the hard way. And we, we, in a lot of ways, we just say, you know what, that's the way it is. Um, we are protected by the UN as an indigenous community and we're pre-constitutional. And it's most interesting, we've never had to fight a war against the U.S. Calvary, so we don't have any of those treaties that were broken. We essentially are uh, the last in the free roaming people. I call my uh, tribe the, the mountain lions of New England. So let's talk about the future. So we'll begin with the University of New Hampshire. Um, we started working with, uh, as a tribal organization, we started working with the University of New Hampshire back at around 2008, um, like really started work hard working with the University of New Hampshire before we would just play with them. Um, but once we really started to focus on higher education and um, focusing on what the needs were within the university system, um, we um, established a Native American and Indigenous Studies minor. Um, so that minor was started in 2019. It was the fastest minor ever established in, at the University of New Hampshire. It took us less than two years. Um, and we made it so they can't get rid of us either. Um, uh, more difficult to get rid of us. Yeah. Nah, they can't get rid of us. We, we, we um, so put the whole catalog and indigenized the whole catalog. Right. So traditionally, um, what a lot of colleges do is they'll actually create courses to fill their Native American and Indigenous Studies minor. What we did is we took the university's existing catalog and we indigenized it. So there are no new courses. Um, so even if they decide to stop offering their course, they're still offering our course. Um, they just don't realize it. So, um, but in the meantime, um, we've been doing a lot of projects on campus. Um, we established campus trails. Um, we're gonna be um, putting in indigenous gardens this spring. Um, we're uh, working with the campus to establish an edible landscape, get, a lot, get rid of all these decorative plants that aren't doing our environment any good and return the original natural landscaping. Um, here are some photos of the signs that were established in the ravine trail at UNH. Um, we uh, applied Abnaki names um, to these trails um, that also give the English translation. Um, uh, we also put QR codes on the signs so you could take your phone and hit the QR code and actually hear the language being spoken and the trail name being pronounced. And, um, and so it's fun. <laughs> so check actually, it out. It's at UNH. This was really an important thing for public safety. And uh, the management at UNH realized that with all of the multitude of trails and walkways throughout the campus, uh, especially in the ravine where it's a little more wild, 
uh, they had no way of identifying wherever problems were. Yeah, they can have the, the blue call boxes, you know, for emergencies, but the trails really didn't have any identification. And this, we, we, this is an experiment. We want to expand this and, and maybe get into the college woods. So it, uh, the town and the uh, campus uh, police are quite interested in doing this because it does give some identification to places and, and things that really are unnamed right now. Mm -hmm. So to get into some of um, the extended programs that we're doing at UNH beyond the minor. Um, so we have uh, New Hampshire Coastwise. Um, it's a year long immersion program where we take um, students and people who are already working as either scientists or within the environmental field with states or other um, agencies. Um, and we're bringing them together and we're helping them think about the work that they're doing in a new way. Um, so we're trying to indigenize their thought process so they realize um, the connection that the work that they do um, has a greater impact on our community. We're also trying to help them build um, stronger collaborations. A lot of times in, the, in these fields, you kind of feel like you're working alone. And so it's nice to have a greater community um, either working on similar projects, if not, you know, um, you know the same project um, in different locations. Um, but being able to lean on each other for ideas and um, other information. We should note that uh, National Science Foundation, a lot of these things funded at um, campuses across the country are funded by the National Science Foundation. They've now integrated on a federal level that to get these grants to be successful, they have to have an indigenous component to have an intersection of Western science with indigenous knowledge keepers, especially in, in locations like here. So we've partnered with quite a few agencies and organizations that are uh, looking at this. Mm -hmm. um, another project is um, the Convergent Arctic Research Perspectives in Education Program, which we lovingly call CARPE. Um, so this is a um, program that's involved um, the Sami in Sweden, um, the Inuit in Alaska, and us here in New Hampshire. Um, each um, Indigenous partner is working with their respective university, and we're all doing climate um, change research. Um, so we've set up sensors and other equipment um, in the um, Spruce Hole Bog and over at a, another site that I'll be talking about in a moment. Um, what we're doing with these sensors is we're measuring um, how fast climate change is hitting. Um, we're, we're putting in um, audio sensors so we can figure out the migrations of the birds or other things that are coming into that region. Um, our goal is to take this data and compare it with our um, other um, Indigenous partners and figure out what's changing and what location and how fast that change is occurring. And hopefully we can lean on each other as Indigenous partners um, to implement changes within our human behavior that will hopefully help benefit our environment. This project was designed to be a community-based thing. What we do is we make our own weather stations and instruments using basic components. We call it a Radio Shack project, which so, we're aging ourselves. We're aging ourselves. But the whole idea is to empower uh, smaller communities that don't have the resources to buy government level uh, sensors and equipment and weather stations to actually build their own from components that are readily available on Amazon, even Home Depot and places like that. So it's meant to be uh, a grassroots movement to actually doing environmental studies. Mm. And it, it's quite successful. Right. Our goal with the program is that a lot of times Indigenous communities simply cannot afford the equipment to do this research. And so our goal is to take a $10,000 sensor and we can build it for a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're doing. Um, we're, that's why we call it our Radio Shack project, because we're taking the actual components and we're building the sensors. So not only can they understand how to use the sensor and how to read the data that's coming from the sensor, but if it breaks, they can actually repair it, which is more environmentally con cautious, a uh, conscience. Um, a lot of times these sent the um, big corporations, they just toss them you know, because they can afford to do so. Um, and that's part of the destruction in the planet that we're trying to avoid. Um, so some of these sensors have been put on to the Great Bay Archaeological Survey. Um, the Great Bay Archaeological Survey is a dig site over in the Great Bay area. Um, and this site is a um, pre-contact site that we've been doing archaeology on. Um, this is approximately a 100-acre site 
Um, there's only been two homes built on this site since colonial times. Uh, one is the original garrison. Um, that's all that remains is the stone cellar. And the other is the homestead that the family still lives in today. Um, it's a very rare site because it's untouched land. It's called virgin land. Um, so as we're going through this site, um, as you can see um, by the top picture, it has incredibly sandy soil, which, as you can tell by the photo, really makes um, the features or the things that we're discovering in the layers of sand really pop out, you know, dramatically at us. Um, in that top photo, what you're looking at is actually a fire pit, the remnants of a fire pit. That's what all those black spotches are, the kind of black streaks in the sand. The, the golden, um, you know, brownish areas are actually fat from a fish or some other animal that was rendered on that site. So they were drying food here and preserving it for the winter. And so what's interesting about this site is because there was so much sand in this, in this area that we're actually able to gather some of the fat compounds. And so they're currently off at the lab so we can actually figure out, you know, definitively what they were rendering for food, um, which is, you know, not very often we're able to do that. In the bottom left-hand corner, um, you, you see some um, uh, gourd or squash seeds. On the bottom right-hand corner are pumpkin seeds. What I don't have pictured were the bean seeds that were found on this site. So they were literally growing the three sisters. Um, what makes this incredible is traditionally here in the Northeast, our soils are so acidic that um, our finds like this would have absolutely disintegrated and we wouldn't have been, we wouldn't have had any traces of them at all. Um, so we're incredibly excited to actually have seeds. We're hoping there's enough DNA left in these seeds where we'll know it's speci specifically what species we were growing at that time. Um, this would be completely new knowledge to both Western and indigenous science. Um, we know we grew the three sisters in the region, but as far as the you know genetic species, uh, we can't tell you. Um, so this would be answering a lost question on both sides. Um, to help share some of the work that's happening on this site and to share some of the um, scientific methods that we're using and making these discoveries and merging both indigenous and scientific knowledge on this discovery of this site, um, we're sharing that um, through an educational course that's going to be taking place this upcoming summer. Um, there are two courses being offered, same material for both courses. Um, each course is a, is a week long. Um, they give you 30 professional um, credit hours uh, for the course. It's open to educators. That's a broad spectrum term. Librarians, um, school educators, homeschoolers, um, you know, people that are community educators. We're taking a very broad look at what an educator is because we want this um, information to get out there and be available to the public. Our goal is to have these individuals go back into their own communities and bring this science and this knowledge with them, help work with the local indigenous tribes in their region and begin this project at their home. Um, so our goal is to spread this you know, um, wealth and help other indigenous tribes get to the point and where we are. Um, we're gonna be offering about a $1,300 stipend um, for the program. And um, we're taking applications, I think up until March. Yeah, so the, the map, we should have said the map that was- Oh, can you back up one more? Yeah. The, the map on there shows uh, all of the endangered sites that are gonna be impacted by climate change and rising sea level. Right. And all of them are known sites that we- so the uh, right the at. pink dots are known uh, historically known important sites um, that that you know are crucial to the state. Um, the blue is what we currently know is going to be lost uh, due to water rise levels. And so, um, as you can see with that intersection, there's a lot of history that's going to be lost. Um, and so we're hoping with uh, programs like this one that other tribal communities will be able to do this research in their own areas, and they will then be able to help focus their resources um, to save the spots that are, they're going to lose versus working on spots that they can maybe push off a little later. Um, so, um, yeah, it's we're, just another whole part yeah. of the program to help teach and educate others. We're taking applications from all over the country and 
And quite frankly, it, this is almost too good a success story. Hopefully we'll be able to duplicate this again, uh, this whole program yep. in the future. It's, Go ahead, I'll let you take this one. You know, we partnered, uh, Kathleen brought this up a, a little earlier about the forest. We, we've partnered with the U.S. Forest Service to look at the, the White Mountains. And the, the partner that we have is a well-known firefighter from the West Coast. He's had multiple years uh, working with the U.S. Forest Service, and he's now located in the White Mountains. And we're looking at the forest um, and how it could be better managed using indigenous practices. And, you know, what happened in California is they gave up on those practices and, and certain tribes in the Great Lakes, like the Menominee, have been still maintaining their fire management techniques to prevent, you know, major forest fires. But uh, here in New England, we've kind of gone the same way as the West Coast. Uh, does Kathleen want to speak a little bit about this? Sure. Um, this is important because all you need to do is take a walk in the woods and you will see branches down, trees leaning, trees down, and all of that uh, material is fodder for forest fire. One of the reasons why they have so many out west in particular is if, you, if you've gone out there and gone for walks in the woods or in the mountains, um, it's the same situation with, with brush everywhere, with branches and leaves. So this is a really important way to preserve our environment. In addition to that, some of the species um, that, th th some of the tree species in particular must have fire in order to germinate their, their plants. So, you know, they'll drop their pine cones, but the pine cones won't open. And I'm saying pine, but softwood tree um, cones will not open if they're not exposed to fire. So there's a lot of um, good, really good things that could happen here. There was a really large forest fire up in the Ossipee area um, a while ago, and, and it was very impactful. So, you know, it's just a matter of time really till that happens again. Okay. And the next slide, we'll move on to INHC. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> Way too far. Yeah, okay. So the next slide that we have is um, Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective, which you've heard us mention um, numerous times throughout the night where we're all members of. Indigenous or INHTC, um, as we lovingly like to call it, it's a lot shorter, um, is a grassroots movement of community um, collaborators, um, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Um, we come from all different walks of life, um, but our main goal is to uplift um, Indigenous history and knowledge and make it part of the normal day inclusion of everyday society. Um, and so we're trying to basically decolonialize um, society. Um, and that a lot of people get scared of that, um, but what we're really doing is we're including indigenous knowledge in the mainstream, and that's not that scary. Um, the feds are trying to do that with environmental practices, which is why the feds are collaborating with indigenous tribes. So um, there's a lot that can be learned um, when you join cultures together. Um, so we're highlighting history, culture, and um, we have currently uh, around 30 fields of study um, that are being researched. Um, we really believe that we can maintain um, a sustainability uh, with the in inclusion of Indigenous knowledge. Um, go ahead. We primarily do anything imaginable. Documentary films, blog spaces, uh, small clips, yep. you name it, we do it. So one of the um, uh, larger projects on the, uh, on the website is the interactive storyboard. Um, this is an ongoing project. Um, this is a, a project that we that INHCC and um, students from UNH work on together. Um, we focus on one area and we research it and then we make that research available to the general public. 
Um, we do that so that way the general public has well vetted resources. We need to stop a lot of the fake history that's going around about the indigenous occupation in this land. And so this is kind of our way of um, tackling that problem and making the um, resources um, available to the public for free. Uh, part of that is developing uh, student curriculum. Uh, so we started a project called the 13 Moons. Um, so in an Abnaki year, we don't run by the traditional calendar that we live by today. We actually run by a lunar cycle. And uh, we have 13 moons in our lunar cycle. And so we broke down um, the 13 moons um, into curriculum where we um, created uh, activities based around what we were doing and during that time period. So for instance, um, if it was um, berry gathering time and we were drying berries, um, we would have curriculum uh, um, revolving around a craft of making pemmican. And so, um, which happens to be one of the ones on there, um, bottom video on the right. <laughs> um, but so that, that curriculum is available on the Indigenous NH um, website and it's available for free um, to everyone. Uh, another uh, curriculum that's available is a food justice curriculum. Um, we broke that down by seasons. And, um, and so each season, uh, we highlight the different foods that we would have been eating at that time period. This was done in collaboration um, with uh, New Hampshire Farm the School, so the New Hampshire school system can use it. So the students will be learning in the classroom about the foods, and then at lunchtime, they'll eat the foods. Um, so it's kind of a holistic approach to education. Um, INHCC, we tackle a lot of um, social issues. Um, and collaborations with partners and institutions throughout the state, um, not just in New Hampshire, uh, Maine, Massachusetts, and Vermont as well. Um, we cover the entire territory. However, our map, um, our interactive map is currently focusing on New Hampshire. Um, just because we have such a large territory, we're kind of focusing on one area and you know, slowly working our way out. Um, we're looking at um, trying to um, re um, remove indigenous mascots in the state. Um, we're also trying to uh, adopt Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, it has nothing to do with Italians. This is about truth and history. Columbus never stepped foot here. The indigenous people were always here. Um, we're also working on historical markers here in the state. So we're establishing new historical markers. Um, these are two markers that are currently in the works that will be appearing in your street near you <laughs> um, this year, hopefully. Um, actually, the foundry is running about six months behind, so it's a matter of when the foundry gets the signs um, constructed. But they will be appearing soon. Um, one was uh, about uh, Richard Waldron and um, what happened with him. And uh, another one is about the Treaty of Portsmouth and um, the issues that um, were revolving around there. And I can see everybody reading. <laughs> so I will leave this up and just jibber jabber okay, here for just a moment. We want them to go see the wonderful signs that will be up very shortly. <laughs> you know, one of the things she didn't mention is because the state uh, has been revisiting all these things that were made probably in the 1950s, you know, these green signs, the state's gone through and they found out a lot of narratives were written from a local and only local perspective. Oh, we're going to get that next slide. <laughs> okay. So do the highly vetted. I've seen some eyes yeah. migrate now. Yeah. All right. So as Paul was saying, we're out there correcting historical markers as well. Um, so on the left, um, you'll find the original text. On the right, um, you'll find um, uh, the revised text. Uh, this marker is still in the process of approval. Um, so it's not finalized yet, but um, we wanted to give an example of what that would look like. And um, I'll wait a hot second while you're all reading again, because <laughs> we all know that this takes a moment. Um, but as you can see in these signs, there's a stark difference in the history of that's being shared here. And, um, and just, you know, because people always scream revisionist history, revisionist history. This was taken from first generation documents from Richard Waldron himself. So we didn't have to make up the story. We didn't have to go very far, you know, to, you know, uncover it either. Um, we were, we were um, blessed to, be, to have found um, letters that Richard had written himself um, to a governor in Maine. Um, and yes. so, I'm sorry, Massachusetts. 
Um, and so we were able to just literally take it just about right at verbatim from his own lips. In other words, we use primary first generation documents, yeah. not later historians. So Richard Waldron became such a fascinating individual um, that we decided that we were going to do a documentary about him and share the true history of Richard Waldron um, here in the region. He's kind of painted like this saintly like you know, human that we can't like live historically live without. Um, the truth was he was an incredibly damaging individual, um, not just to the indigenous population, but to the Puritan population as well. And Quakers. And, and the Quakers. And, um, and uh, the true history of this man should be told. Um, next up is an augmented reality app. Um, and, Ka and Catherine here can tell us about this as well since she's part of this project. Um, this is a app um, that's being done with three sites, um, Orion State Park, Star Island, and Strawberry Bank. Um, we're uh, putting up um, everyone's, oh, if, if you haven't seen of it, you have at least heard of Pokemon Go. Um, it's the same idea as Pokemon Go, except instead of Pikachu, you're going to see indigenous um, history come to light, come to life. Um, and I don't know, Catherine, do you want to give a, an opinion here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this uh, app, which I'm the creative producer of, uh, working with our Indigenous collaborators, a developer and an illustrator, uh, was funded by um, a, a federal grant and will be launching in the middle of March. So uh, you'll be able to download it for free from the Apple Store and I um, an Android store as well and go out and explore Abenaki culture on your own. But if you follow um, indigenousnh.com, INHCC's website and the Kaosa fans website, you'll be able to find out more about that release. Um, but uh, I'll not talk about that just, just more. There's a few more things that we're going through and then uh, hopefully there'll be a little time for questions. Yeah, we've got to, yeah. We've got to move it along. The, the other one is we, we are doing another uh, one that's not funded by the same grant, but we're working with Dartmouth to do one that shows the intersection of Shaker life in the 1700s with the Abnaki in, in the exchange of herbal medicines, because the Shakers were well known for the medical uh, practices, which were very progressive in the time, and their basket making. So we're doing another virtual reality at the Enfield Shaker village that's uh, being funded in, and documented by Dartmouth College. Mm. Um, another project um, that um, some of you may have heard of, it came out just about a year ago now, and not quite, but just about, um, was Swimming Upstream. Uh, this is a documentary done about um, uh, dams and about waterway reclamation, and uh, we focused on the herring. The river herring. Um, and so um, we created the documentary as well as curriculum. Um, to support that, uh, to use in the educational, uh, the documentary is 28 minutes. We did that on purpose so that way it could be shown in schools. Um, the curriculum coincides and um, it really works well together. Um, and matter of fact, it was so popular, the Boston school system actually reached out and created curriculum based on our documentary and curriculum. Um, so it's quite a, quite exciting when a major school system, you know, en endorses the work that you do. And on the end of the table is our producer. Right. For Swimming Upstream, Catherine did that work as well. <laughs> and, um, and that work was all done in um, part to have the Mill Pond Dam removed in Durham. Um, that we were the the educational session um, regarding that dam was highly successful. Um, the town, um, once it was brought to a town vote, the town re voted to remove it by seventy four point one percent, which is huge, um, considering this dam was on the historical register. Um, what also makes this so important is that um, the they had um, over thirty three hundred voters come out for that vote. What and that's super impressive for a presidential election. They only get about 1,100 voters, so that shows how critically important this dam was to the community and um, how the community came together to make sure their voices were heard. Mm -hmm. So that's a project that's in the works. Um, we're now meeting with the public um, and talking about the process of removal, um, and you know we're now planning all that as well as beginning the um, to discuss. Um, what we want to put in place once the dam is removed. Uh, there, there was also the Exeter Dam, which you're all familiar with. That yeah. was another project that we didn't highlight to you. Yeah. 
Um, another thing that you can currently go and do today, or well, maybe not right today because it's eight o'clock at night, but tomorrow, um, if you feel like you can take a ride over to the McAuliffe um, Shepherd Discovery Center over in Concord. Um, we work with them to create the first Indigenous Sky Story planetarium film for the Northeast. Um, so uh, we're very proud of this story. Catherine helped us with this. She does all our filming. She's amazing. Um, I wrote the story and narrated it, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. Um, and so if you're available to go take a ride out to Concord, um, we encourage you to do so. I would encourage you to check the schedule book. And so last slide, um, what can you do? Um, so these are um, some things that we try to leave um, so people can think about what you can do in your everyday life to uplift and include Indigenous voices and knowledge. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it on my end. You can leave that up if you want. Yeah, just, for, just for a moment. I see tons of eyes reading again. <laughs> I, I think and I apologize. I know we do get a little wordy on our slides, but when you're talking 13,000 years of history <laughs> and... Uh, 45 minutes and get a little tough. <laughs> this is the short version. Um, just so you know that uh, the reason we do a lot of this educational stuff, we're not in the past tense. We're here with you today. We're a part of the, what well, we always use these terms like we're weavers, but we say we're, we're the individual fibers that made up this country. And we're alive and well, and we're trying to uh, build community. And that community is all of you with us. So if you have any more questions or information or anything that you'd like to reach out to us, um, here's our contact information. Um, you can reach us at um, uh, kawasak.org or indigenousnh.com. And um, there's contact um, information on both websites. Yeah, everything eventually ends up on my desk anyway. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Paul and Denise, for that information and for Anne, your beautiful story, and Kathleen, your contribution to uh, all the work that we're doing. Uh, we took the time tonight to look at the past, present, and future of Indigenous culture because the kind of remit that the library gave us as a group was to, you know, to frame and think about what it means to be running events in the year that the town has decided to call uh, a celebration of its history, but only calling that 400 years. And so we know that that was a huge amount of information to take in. As you say, there's additional resources there and the library will be offering all of the, all of the kind of content that was mentioned tonight, a chance for you to receive that information in terms of book lists, further reading and everything. But we can just take a moment, a breath. <laughs> And I'd love to open up uh, both our, our, our digital floor, the chat, which hopefully we can, um, Katie can help me with a little bit, but also the room to everyone else here in our last kind of 10, 15 minutes to any thoughts, ob observations, or questions. And so an, an arm shot straight up. So I'm just going to come uh, right to you and yeah. feel free to um, address the group. I'll come to the center of the room and then I see if there too. Thank you. Thank you so much, first of all. This was so much incredible information and so thank you for your time and coming. Um, this is kind of a super quick question, but I was just wondering why um, the like number eight? Yeah, it's a letter. So, um, so you're talking about uh, the number eight being used in our language. Um, so because we're Anglophiles, we're English down here in the Americas, um, the English didn't have the, the nasally on sound that the French do. So the French do the O with the little hat on top. So when you look at English versus French Abnaki, the French um, have the word with the O with the hat because the English didn't have that pronounce, that sound in their vocabulary. They had to come up with a, with a letter for it. That's how the eight came in. All right. So, so when you see the letter eight, um, it's actually an on sound. All right. Um, so now it came up to the to an issue of why do we use an eight instead of the O with the hat? It's just cooler. You know? <laughs> so it's as simple as that. You know, and and besides the fact that we are living here in the American side of the border, which would make us Anglophiles. And so it's historically accurate. Mm -hmm. The village in Canada was actually divided between the Roman Catholic. It's right down the middle of the, uh, what they call the reserve. And on the other, 
the Roman Catholic one side and the Anglican Church, or Church of England on the other side. So you, you, you can see it with the old speakers. They, they, we call them Anglophiles or Francophiles. And we've opted to do this with the eight. Right. You'll also notice in our language, um, it's very difficult to find the same words spelled the same way twice mm -hmm. um, because we're an audio, audible language. And so dependent upon the first language of whoever is hearing it, they will spell it in the language that they're accustomed to. Um, so the letters can always vary. Um, yeah. Winn Winnipesaukee has over 50 spellings. In our, yeah, in our language, we have over 50 spellings of Winnipesaukee. And even today, contemporarily, there are two spellings on the, on the, on the state and federal maps um, for Winnipesaukee. So it okay. still survives. We had somebody <laughs> just for a second, just come to Anne. Did you um, unmute to make a comment? I just want to make sure that we're including our virtual uh, audience here. Anne Dennison, did you have anything to add there on the language point of view? Yeah, no, I, it was just, it, it is interesting how it happened. It, and it also, it, you know, it did matter if, um, if the language, if the Abenaki was being translated, you know, from French or from English or from, Ab, you know, Abenaki being written down. But um, I think I just wanted to, to mention that the Abenaki became literate, you know, very early. I know that Denise and Paul referred to that also. But because the contact here in the Northeast with the Europeans was the earliest of anywhere on the entire North American continent, we've had uh, the longest history of interaction. And so that makes for lots of different opportunities to see um, the way this oral language was written down mm -hmm. amongst all of the other impacts that the longevity of that contact has had. Thank mm. you. And I also seen just a, a quick comment in the chat, just a thank you for the, the presentation um, and for uh, keeping the, looking after the land and the waterways and keeping the truth of indigenous people alive. So mm. I just wanted to bring that into the room. And I think we have another question over here. Hi. Uh, Hi. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, uh, so much information to trigger the second college course. Um, I love the idea. Imagine taking our course. It's <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, love the idea of making a school or making a school. Um, they look like queer sensors and plastic up on the screen. <laughs> yep. So we use what we have and no, we that's... needed to keep moisture from landing on the sensor for to keep it from working and so a, a plastic cup was the perfect solution yeah there's there's interesting things even like measuring snow there are different ways of doing it we can use like a sonic device on a tripod made out of uh polyethylene pipe that we buy at radio shack and it it, it scans the ground you get a, a reading and once it it changes you can know the depth of the snow i mean there's a lot of tricks that we've been using right. uh, now i used a, a a two cent plastic cup but if i went to the manufacturer and bought the little plastic enclosure it would cost me about 300 bucks they were also using like uh 3d plastic uh, modeling to make components as well. Right, and, like things I can't like just pull a cup out for. Yeah. Um, we're sending the students back in and they're actually designing things um, out of 3D plastic molding. Um, so to so that, you know, we're trying to get the kids to invent stuff as well. So- Even yeah. sounds. Yeah. Students, it's all it's students. Um, so our goal, so I can bring someone in, and we do, because I don't know how to build this stuff. You know, let's be clear. I have no clue how to build this stuff. Um, but we bring in professionals, you know, professors that do this, you know, and educate students for a living that do this. Um, but we're looking for innovation. You know, so they can teach us the basics, but then uh, we're relying on the students to be like, oh, my, let's do, put this here and let's do this to that sensor. And now we can do this and we can measure this. And so um, or we're taking the equipment and we're modifying it for a new um, research project that another student wants to do. Um, and so, you know, like, for instance, um, um, the methane sensors. Right. We were going to do uh, like in the bog spaces, we're looking at permafrost disappearing up in the Arctic Circle. So you, you look at the 
the Aggie side of UNH, and we measure methane from cow poop. From cow poop, they put the little methane they put sensors. A little, so we use the same kind of technology. We can put it in the swamp and measure how much you know methane's been given off as as it melts. It, so these are all applicable to the Arctic as well. And the other thing that we found interesting, the students liked a lot of the the, the cute things like uh, measuring sound. And they found apps that you could use with your iPhone and like dissect the, just random air sounds and develop all the bird species that go through the area. And they can just break them out by frequency and identify all the species. Even though it sounds like random noise of the woods, you can analyze that. And it takes basically the technology on a phone. Right. And they were like, we didn't see this bird, but it was clearly there. Yeah. You know, because we have audio recordings of it. So how much have we missed as, as humans, you know, because we just don't have those extra sensory gifts um, that is now being picked up by modern technology. Well, this is changing the dynamics of research and science. And so there has to be space made, um, you know, for this type of development. You know, you know it's, it's kind of like citizens. We, we can go on about this <laughs> forever. <laughs> it, it's like STEM brought to the, to the average person. You can tell we're passionate. <laughs> Anybody? Any so I'm, just gonna, I'm just going to come to a few more yeah. comments in the chat as well. Um, just to say that how do people, how can people get involved with all of this work or learn out some more? Absolutely. The Kerasop Band's own website, but also if you're interested in the collaborative, which is what the, the, the question was specifically about, Kathleen Blake put in the chat indigenousnh.com you can get contact information and ways to get involved there about stepping forward and, and bringing your own skills to the table and working together so there's that mm -hmm. um, and then also there was a question of how many collaborators do you think you work with it is, um, <laughs> we it is so big in fact we have no clue honestly we actually now have a, a campus office on you know for research we have in more Hall, and we have a lab of a, that's been assigned to us. We couldn't do this without the UNH dedicated faculty and researchers. Uh, they've all partnered with us, and I, there's a list of people a mile long. Uh, you have no idea how many projects we've got. A lot of them are centered here in the Great Bay, Great Bay uh, 2030. Uh, there's culvert projects, there's uh, waste plastic projects, there's uh, fish waste projects, there's the fort project, which was the, the uh, uh, you know, aquatic uh, farming, uh, steelhead trout. There's so many projects going on simultaneously. You just, we just hang on to the tail of the cow as it's running through <laughs> the field. And we rely a lot on the researchers that work with us. If we didn't have them, we couldn't get this far. Yeah. I'm going to come to uh, Kathleen. I saw you raise your hand in on on our on my screen here. Yeah. Yes. One thing that would be, um, if anybody is interested in um, history and searching primary source source documents for um, information about colonial uh, interactions with the indigenous. We, we could use people in, in each town to be doing that in the town records. And also, if you're, an, if you're a retired educator like we, we are, um, working on curriculum for children to learn um, the real history of what happened here and our, our students um, need more, um, our teachers need more access to curriculum. So those two things are... I see personally as needs because it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and many hands make the, the task lighter. Thank you. We've identified one particular problem uh, with engineering at UNH and uh, I'm an engineer retired is uh, the curriculum requires such a rigid uh, format to become an engineer. There's not much latitude to do this kind of uh, indigenization of uh, engineering. And if there are any retired engineers out there who would like to work with me, we're trying to figure out how we can indigenize some basic courses so that uh, the engineering endeavors are not ignored in it. And that's one of the interesting things we identified very recently that uh, they don't have the bandwidth to be able to, because of labs and all the other things that are rigidly controlled, how can we indigenize and show uh, Western science and uh, Western math, how indigenous math and indigenous knowledge can be integrated with uh, engineering skills. So that's one of the things I'm looking at. 
Great. I saw that there was a, a hand raised here and then I'll come over here. So down the totally non-technical. How do your kids learn to speak the language? They don't. Really? <laughs> no, the problem is like everything. It's like church. You know, it, it, we age out and there's not that. If we had kids for immersion, yeah, they pick it up like crazy, but uh, it's, it's difficult when you're spread throughout the nation, yeah, you know, because of employment or other issues. Um, and so we're now relying on internet, um, you know, Zoom and other uh, measures uh, to carry forward education, which is what, quite frankly, which is why we're so heavily delved into education. Um, because it's not just about our local people. We're, this knowledge is being spread throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing here at UNH and in New Hampshire, our tribal members are learning in California, in Texas, and in Washington, or wherever they're residing as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's bringing the education all together in one place. We just happen to be doing it in this locale. Are there enough people in this area that have family? I mean, that might be interested in learning language. You know, so the, the problem is, is that um, we all our first language speakers are dead. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll start there. They're all dead. So what do you have left? We have the dictionaries, and that's what we're currently learning from now. I am not a I am not a, a fluent speaker. I know enough to say you know hello and introduce myself. I know my songs. I know my prayers, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you, you know, words for animals and things like that, but I can't sit here and hold a conversation with you in Abnaki. Um, Plus, there's nobody to talk to. So, <laughs> you know, that, that feeling, right? <laughs> got it. But that brings us back to Zoom, you know? Um, so when you don't have a large community that's centrally located, um, you, it's, as Paul said, it's hard to talk to yourself and learn a language. Do you think that it will die out? No, because we have too many um, educational resources available. What will die out is the fluency. But right. with that being said, there are so many people, both indigenous and non-indigenous, that like linguistics, who are interested in learning the language, that it's never going to die out. Um, totally. I think what's going to end up happening is the language over time is going to morph. Um, you're going to find that Abnaki is going to, um, we're already speaking a slang Abnaki when it comes to, you know, language, you know, when you break the language down. The contemporary Abnaki is already slang. But I, I believe that as time goes on, it's going to get even more slangish. Um, and so what we're going to be speaking in the future is going to be something new anyways. This is a whole subject matter I could spend another We whole could spend lot. two hours on and this. And I could tell you how it's my Can I jump in for a minute? Anne's, Anne's been working on language materials that have been Yeah, about. there are, um, you know, you mentioned Zoom, and I, I noticed somebody put the Bruchak's name into the, the chat. There, there are online every day um, people working on trying to, you know, uh, learn enough Abenaki uh, to, to be able to share that information with other people. Very few people are even close to fluent. Um, I would imagine Jesse Bruchak and his kids are pretty close to it, but as, you, as Paul said, who are you going to talk to? Um, but it's very enriching to learn the words. You know, I, I had so much fun when I went up to Canada to visit the reservation at Odenak, and I'm looking at the map, look at the names of the, the streets, and there's like Tolba, that's turtle, there's Nolka, that's deer. I'm looking and, and recognizing the words, you know, made sense to me. When, when Denise and Paul were singing that song, they were saying, um, uh, uh, Olioni, which is, you know, um, thank you. And they were saying Nido Bak, which is friends. And we do recognize, you know, words and phrases and they enrich us. But also, you know, I mentioned this like 500 plus years of interaction. There are many, I mean, look around New Hampshire, look around the Northeast, <laughs> our, our place names, they all mean something. We all of us say Abenaki words every time we travel anywhere in New Hampshire. The thing to do is to look in some of these dictionaries that are available readily online and for free um, and, you know, learn what some of these places actually mean, you know, why they were, and, it, you'll, and you'll go, oh, well, sure, because usually they describe the geographic feature of a place. Um, so while we say that Abenaki actually is, you know, like listed as one of the most endangered languages of, of indigenous languages in the world, 
um, it's not, as Denise said, going to go away because it has been preserved in, in dictionary form, in the form of uh, Catholic prayer books and hymns. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that, that the language was written down by the Jesuits and others since the, you know, early 16, late 15, early 1600s. The original so Abnaki is actually in the vault in Harvard. Uh, it was documented with Royale and it hasn't really seen the light of day. The language we're doing now is Western Abnaki, why we say it's kind of a slang. It's It's been uh, somewhat modified after King Philip's War. Mm -hmm. And the we don't use the word Western Abnaki. We like to refer to the Penacook dialect, which was the original dialect, which was right from here. But I'm not going to go down that course. <laughs> Very long, convoluted discussion. We're a, little, we're a few minutes over, but I, I do want to just come to this one last question right. here in the room. Where, before one second up. before you jump, um, because we did not put a slide up for it. One of the projects we are working on is um, including the original place names um, back here in the state. Not that we're looking to change the name. You know, we want to say, you know, Nashua, you know, place of two rivers. You know, we want to explain what the names mean. So that way, that's another form for the language to live on um, in the wider community of beings. All right, go ahead. No, you I just watched The Great Dying on mm -hmm. PBS. Um, is that part of this? Yeah, The Great Dying took place here. Yeah. 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 All the way up the East Coast, all the way up to Canada. What is Canada now? Yeah. And and down as far as Rhode Island. Yeah, the, the, what we can gather started way up in Montreal, went all the way down to probably Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island, maybe Connecticut. But it, it took quite a few years. It was almost a 50-year migration of disease, uh, not like the pandemic here, where there was what we think was brought by Basque fishermen or a European fishermen that were working the St. Lawrence. Yeah, it was just interesting how things could have been so different had that not happened in the colonialization right. had a lot more names, you know. Well see people don't realize that they think colonialization started in like 16, you know, 1600 here. In reality, um, it's well known in the Spanish records um, that in the 1530s they were already complaining that there were over 500 um, international ships fishing the coast of Maine. And they were already complaining about overfishing the Gulf of Maine at that time. And this was, you know, a hundred years before the first homestead was ever established here from the Western culture. So we had contact long before, um, you know, and people failed to realize as well um, that, you know, um, Squanto said, you know, welcome Englishmen in English. I'm sorry, the Squantum said, welcome Englishmen to the, um, to the pilgrims when they landed. He had already been to England and back by that point. He had already been taken as a slave to England and had returned back. So, you know, there's a long history here. It's just that um, American history, quite frankly, is trying to dumb us down. And um, there's a lot out there and we can just be better, yeah. you know, for for all of us and for the future generations. Actually, the, the first person to talk to the, the pilgrims was Samoset. And he came right out of the Kennebec watershed area. And he was traveling down to meet the Squantum to see how they were doing, because he was probably following the disease that was had already spread. And uh, he was the first one. So it was actually somebody from this region that met the pilgrims. And then they introduced him to the Patuxet uh, Wampanoag. Yeah. So it's uh, my great honor. I'm going to have to pull this up because I want to yeah. be respectful of everybody's time. But... Uh, these questions that you have, these, these thoughts, these things, they may be just emerging today or maybe you've been wondering them all your life. There are resources here in our community. There, this information is in this community. I want to thank the library for hosting this kind of event in, at this particular time of year. I want to thank you all for coming out in the cold. Uh, you get an extra bonus point. Uh, thank you to everyone online for joining us as well. Again, the resources will be shared um, with those that came, but the library is always here. Thank you to Anne and Kathleen, to Paul and Denise. I'm very honoured to collaborate with you. And I just want to leave it open if our Indigenous uh, individuals have anything you'd like to say in, in closing. And Kathleen? No, it's just always a pleasure and honour and a joy to be able to share this information with interested um, 
minds and uh, allies for the indigenous people. Thank you all for your interest. What Anne said. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank you both and um, for all the work that you do and for the collaboration and for the friendship. And um, I'm just really looking forward to all the work that we're going to be doing this summer and all these grand openings that are going to be happening. And I really hope you, everyone here is able to join us. Here we say Gisiluni, great thanks to all of you coming here tonight. Uh, and just travel safe journey. We say uh, yeah, Oli Bam can eat, you know, have a protect your life and go safely. Thank you everyone. Thank yeah. you.